Okay, are you seeing the slideshow? Yes. You have to switch the view. Hold on one second. Switch view to. Um, you have to make it opposite of what it's doing because we're seeing okay. your view. Okay. Bear with. Come on. I'll just do it this way. Um, here. Hmm? I'm talking to myself. Oh, okay. Just no one problem. second. I, I need it to. I'm a slideshow. There we go. From the beginning. Okay. Now I want to share screens with you guys. I need to find you again. Damn it. There you are. Deb. Are you over here? Oh, Deb's not here yet. I don't... Mm, okay. Bear with, bear with. Share screen. Will somebody um, request captions for me? Thank you. Come on. I know how to set Deb up when she gets here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Jen. I need this over here. Now I should be able to do the slideshow. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. Can you now see the slide? Not yet. You got a screen share. Okay. This should be. Now, can you see this? Looks slide? beautiful. I oh guess. my goodness. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Yeah. Do we got that? Yep. Oh, yeah. Wait, do we? Did uh, you see Stephanie? Stephanie's right yeah. here. She's coming in. Hi, yeah, I thought I saw you. Sorry. Hi. Um, in the list, uh, I'm going to start recording to the cloud. We are ready to begin. Uh, so far, everybody's in. I think we're good. Okay. Uh, and then I'll watch the chat and you just need to tell me when you want to uh, move. This oh, up. don't worry about the chat, Tammy. No, okay. I got it. Hey, everybody. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, I'll pause it when we go to the next slide. I'm sorry, okay. Jennifer. Okay. Uh, what did you say about the next slide, Jennifer? I will pause it when okay. we... I will pause it when we go to the next slide. That is the reader that she's talking about. All right. I'm going to um, mute myself. Okay, here we go. Hi, let's get started. We will be recording today's webinar. Our first slide has a blue background with the IDJ and ICADV logos. Welcome to Indiana Disabilities Justice's presentation of structural ableism, what it is, and how we can address it. Sponsored by Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I am your host, Jennifer Milhar Sick. Next slide. I am your host, Jennifer Milhar Sick. This slide has six icons a record button, a mic with a line through it, a closed captioning icon an icon with a wrench and screwdriver that says tech support, multiple colored question marks, and finally, hands spelling out ASL. We are recording, and the webinar will be on our hub shortly. Please remember to mute your mic. CART is providing closed captioning available under the closed captioning icon in your Zoom window. 
You can put tech support and questions in the chat. Finally, we are offering ASL. You can access this. I will be describing any graphics on the slides. Okay. I will be describing any graphics on the slides. This is our disclaimer. It says our views and materials are not necessarily those of our funders, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the Indiana Department of Health and Human Services. Mentioned is endorsed by the U.S. government. This slide has this this slide has pictures of IDJ staff helping with this. Sierra Olivia Thomas Williams, Tammy Femmel, and myself. Sierra is smiling into is wearing a pink floral shirt with salt and pepper, shoulder length hair. Tammy is a brown haired woman with short hair. Pale complexion with glasses and a big grin wearing a blue blouse. Seated before a blooming plant with red flowers. I am wearing blue jeans and a red plaid fleece and am hugging my dog. The top half of my brownish blonde hair is pulled back. Sierra Olivia Thomas Williams, MA is a prevention specialist at Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence and CEO founder of IDJ. She will be helping with chat and technical assistance. Tammy Femmel is part of Indiana Disability Justice Leadership and CEO at Accessibility. She will be helping with slides. I am your host, Jennifer Milhar Sick. I am part of the leadership as well as the webinar coordinator. I was born with cerebral palsy. Deb Brown is our card captioner. Thank you, Deb. With that out of the with that out of the way, let's move on to bigger and better things. We have four sections. Our introduction into disability justice, ableism, and structural ableism and how it applies to sexual violence prevention. Then an informative look at universal design. Next, we will have our panelists share their experiences. Finally, time for questions and answers. Image description. Oh, yeah. Image description, eight palm together, three green, three yellow, and two red. There is one blue palm set aside. How does disability justice fit into primary prevention of sexual violence? As I started my work with IDJ, I had this. As I started my work with IDJ, I had the same question. What I learned is that the risk of sexual violence and other crime increases dramatically in communities on the fringes of society. These communities include those with disabilities, those with different sexual orientations, those with different gender identities, those of different races, and I can go on and on. Research has found that when communities are raised up and seen as valuable and equal parts of society, crime, including sexual violence, decreases, and that is the aim of disability justice. IDJ's mission is to prevent violence among people with disabilities. We do this by uplifting the voices of the disabled community. IDJ has, IDJ has talked about ableism many times, but let us review. Ableism is discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities based on the belief that having what is considered typical abilities is superior. This false belief leads to another belief that these people need to be fixed. An ableist attitude seeks to define a person by their disability. There are different types of ableism. Check out our latest webinars, Paving Towards an Inclusive World, about systemic ableism which includes public policy and organizational practices. And defined and shared, the voices of systemic ableism, a panel discussion on systemic ableism. Today we will be talking...
No, no. Today we will be talking about structural ableism. This slide shows a staircase with a wheelchair at the bottom. What is structural ableism? It refers to the physical inaccessibility that effectively deny entry and equal use by people with disabilities. This term can mean physical structures and spaces like buildings and parks or infrastructures such as transit systems and sidewalks. Structural ableism is part of systemic ableism, just as apple belongs to fruits. Structural ableism is its own distinct category under the umbrella of systemic ableism. Eliminating, stru Eliminating structural ableism is essential to sexual violence preventionists. ITJ is a sexual violence prevention program of ICADV. We use a four-step public health approach to violence prevention. Identify the problem. Address factors that increase and decrease violence, evaluate the process and outcomes, and share the results. Eliminating ableism gets at the root problem power imbalances and power over marginalized communities and people. People with disabilities are far more likely to experience sexual violence than their peers without disabilities. This is to the social isolation caused by structural ableism making it important for us to understand ableism and structural ableism and to increase social and environmental inclusion as a step toward eliminating sexual violence against people with disabilities. In order to see our impact, we need to press local and state health organizations to collect data on sexual violence occurrence in the disability community. This has not been happening, leaving us vulnerable. Through providing technical assistance, trainings, assessments, both locally and nationally, and hub contributions, we can share our knowledge and progress in disability justice and violence prevention. Our next slide has an Our next slide has an image saying stop sexual violence top. Inside an octagon shape are the five strategies to prevent sexual violence which include teach skills, provide opportunities, support survival, promote protective norms, and create protective environments. Here we see five strategies to end sexual violence. Although all of these apply to decreasing ableism, I am going to highlight two of these, creating protective environments and promoting protective norms. Addressing structural ableism means we are creating protective environments, a strategy to end sexual violence perpetration. This is a community-level approach which recognizes that characteristics of physical environments influence personal behaviors positively or negatively. Making a person feel safe and supported in their environment promotes intolerance of sexual violence. When these environments are created, care must be taken to be inclusive. Inclusivity is also a product of shifting social norms. When people are included in the larger community, they are seen as deserving of recognition and value, leading violence and sexual violence to decrease. But people with disabilities can only be included if their access needs are met. When people are included in the larger community, they are seen as deserving of recognition and value, leading yeah. violence and sexual violence to decrease. But people with disabilities can only be included if their access needs are met. Now, we will learn about one such strategy for creating protective environments and promoting protective norms called universal design. Universal design allows for the maximum amount of accessibility for all kinds of people. When communities, and environments within the community are accessible, it moves towards becoming a protective environment and a shifting in norms by sending a message to people with disabilities that they are welcomed, wanted, and valued. Universal, Universal design is creating spaces that are inclusive for all people with disabilities. It is a step above what the ADA commands. In 1997 at North Carolina State University, 
Ronald Mace gathered a group of architects, product designers, engineers, and environmental design researchers who came up with seven principles of universal design. These principles can be used to evaluate existing structures, guide new designs, and educate others. This slide this slide has a graphic of people with different disabilities. A banner says universal design. Under the people it says making design accessible to everyone in society. Principle 1. Equitable use. Equitability is giving each individual what is needed for equality, in other words, making an environment useful and marketable to all abilities. In a building. Having room signs in large print is very important, but having braille on them as well makes the use of the signs equally usable. Principle 2. Flexibility in use. This can be done by considering and accommodating different preferences and abilities. For example, having different counter heights or different kinds of chairs with and without arms. Principle 3. Simple and intuitive use. The use of design is easy to understand. This can be a hotel having a room design where a certain flooring leads the patron from the door to the hotel desk. Principle 4. Perceptible information. This communicates necessary information effectively to the user. Having accessible smoke and fire alarms clearly lets people who are deaf and hard of hearing know there is a need for evacuation. Principle 5. Tolerance for error. This principle strives to minimize hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. This can look like stores making aisles wide enough for wheelchairs and free from tripping hazards. Principle 6. Low physical effort. This means design can be used efficiently and comfortably and with a minimum of fatigue. Providing benches along the walkway can be comfortable and reduce fatigue. Principle 7. Size and space for approach and use. This is when appropriate size and space are provided for approach, reach, manipulation, and use. An example is allowing for adequate space at a customer service window to write without bumping against a wall or divider. As we look at universal design applied to different disabilities, we can see how to create a welcoming environment which will promote positive behaviors and thus reduce the likelihood of sexual violence. It should be noted that these accommodations are not all inclusive. Universal design is not a one size fits all. Nor is it expected that all accommodations will be met in one setting, although it would be great. There is a black and white there is a black and white graphic showing a figure using a cane for the blind. When considering people with visual disabilities, ableism looks like inadequate lighting and open spaces without environmental cues. Using tactile cues such as floor texture, sound, heat, and smell provide landmarks. Landmarks can define spaces and functions to people without sight. Changes in floor texture signal upcoming changes in floor height like stairs. Those with low vision can use bright colors, wall murals, and changes in lighting to recognize different spaces. The use of entryway oh. The use of entryways and vestibules help eyes adjust to changes in lighting. On this slide there are a wheelchair, crutches, and a walker. Absence of ramps Rooms crowded with furniture, and restrooms without an accessible stall are examples of ableism. The universal design suggestions for meeting the needs of persons with mobility disabilities include measurements for rooms, doorways, and restrooms. There should be a 78-inch by 60-inch area for a person who uses a wheelchair to sit and turn around. Doorways should be at least 32 inches wide. In restrooms, the sink should be no higher than 34 inches from the floor and grab bars are to be near the toilet and in the shower. Besides those, 
it is recommended that counters and tables be at varying heights to accommodate people who are standing or sitting. Full-length mirrors also accommodate persons of different heights. This slide has a black outline of an ear with a sound wave coming out. Noisy environments and distance between individuals are common ableist structures against people with auditory disabilities. Optimizing hearing for all enhances any environment. This can be accompanied by reducing reverberations and background noises. Objects that produce sound or noise should be strategically positioned and maintained in order to prevent them from interfering with essential hearing. Limiting the distance between the person and desired sound, be it human or other sound, will also ensure better hearing. For example, reducing the width of a customer service counter will allow closer proximity to those communicating. This slide has a graphic this slide has a graphic with words written in different fonts and sizes. The words include neurodiversity, brain variations, autism, bipolarity, ADHD, OCD, and others. Now on to providing spaces that incorporate those who are neurodivergent or have sensory disabilities. This includes those on the autism spectrum, ADHD, and with some mental disabilities such as schizophrenia and bipolar. Busy, noisy atmospheres and some lighting are forms of ableism against people with these disabilities. It is important to consider acoustics, looking at background noise, and echo and reverberation. These can exasperate a person who has a neurodivergent disability. In contrast, natural light can be calming to the senses plus enjoyable for everyone. Another calming feature is having escape spaces. These are places with low stimulus that an individual with neurodivergence can use if they are overstimulated. Piping the program into the area may be helpful if users can switch it off and have volume control. Areas with different activities should be in a large enough room to group activities by stimulus level. For example, Separating quiet activities from louder and more active ones allow the persons with sensory sensitivities to prepare for the activity level. Now we will hear from a pan Now we will hear from a panel of people with disabilities about how structural ableism affects their ability to access places and spaces. Let's turn to the panel and learn about their lived experience. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Before we dig into structural ableism, let's meet our panelists. Please introduce yourself and let us know your thoughts on universal dis yeah. Please introduce yourself and let us know your thoughts on universal design. Our first Okay. Tell me. Go for it. Hi, my name is Tony and I'm a quadriplegic from a spinal cord injury. I've experienced quite a diversity of lack of universal design in my many decades using public transit. However, in instances where I was in a universally designed space, it made function for not only me, but the community at large much more flowing and usable. That's my experience. Thank nice you. Thank you, Tony. Um, how, <coughs> how about you, Lexi? Lexi? Sorry. I was trying to figure out everything with my screen reader. Hi, I'm Lexi Westerfield. I am an individual with a um, with legal blindness, a mobility impairment. I'm a wheelchair user, and I have uh, intellectual developmental disability. Um, I love universal design. I've visited multiple spaces with universal design. 
but I've also experienced structural ableism um, while attending college and while visiting other spaces and also um, on public transit, I've experienced it um, specifically just kind of the structural ableism of the paratransit world and the availability of public transit, um, a little bit in education, a little bit in employment, um, some other things like that. Um, so grateful to be here to talk about it. Thank you, Lexi. How about you, Stephanie? Okay, so my name is Stephanie Wynn, and um, about 13 years ago, I developed an autoimmune disease as well as um, chronic vertigo and dizziness secondary to some neurological issues. Um, I am married and I have two kids. Um, and I was a speech there. I, I am a speech therapist, but I haven't been able to work for the past year and a half as my symptoms became more constant. Um, so I am home right now. And as far as universal design, I really had only thought about it before um, with things like not having a ramp or an elevator. Um, but for me, the things that make it difficult to be places are um, visual movement, like ceiling fans or lots of visual movement happening, a lot of screens. So just how most restaurants now have multiple televisions, um, those cause dizziness and things like if you're trying to go to a musical or something, strobe lighting um, makes it to where I can't attend those things. So, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Captain. Our first question is, will you describe a personal example of how structural ableism has affected you? Next. Okay, Stephanie. Did you say Stephanie? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, before getting worse this year and a half ago, I attended the YMCA multiple days per week. Um, and kind of in that environment, you become friends with people who go to the same classes each week. So I had been going to the same Zumba class for several years with a lot of the same women. And then they ended up changing kind of the setup and turned off the lights and put on a strobe light because Zumba is hip hop dancing. I don't know if people know. And so she said she felt like that made people feel more comfortable as they couldn't see themselves in the mirror quite as clearly, or maybe didn't feel like others were able to watch them as clearly. But for me, even a second of being in a room with strobe lights just caused immediate vertigo. Um, and so, yeah, it made it to where I wasn't able to continue attending those classes. And I asked the teacher about um, maybe like one one week a month having separate lighting um, so that I could continue to go but they didn't do that so yeah it was just a bummer and um, like I was gonna say something else but I can't remember now so so that's one example thank you um, how about you, Tony? Yes, the uh, clearest example I have experienced of structural ableism is one time I went to use a public bus. Granted, this was many years ago, but as I boarded the bus, the lift had difficulty so it took quite a while. Once I got in the bus and positioned myself, 
one of two passengers who were inebriated came up to me and started uh, quite a loud rant on people like you shouldn't be out in public. There's places for you. You shouldn't be on this bus just slowing everyone down. The driver did not intervene. Thankfully, uh, elderly woman stood up by the cane and said, shut up before I knock you down. And that ended that. Mm -hmm. But that was my clearest example of it. And thereafter, everything went fine. But it was a blatant example of it. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Um, Bradley, how about you? Um, an example I can think of is living on IUPUI's campus in Indianapolis. Um, I was thinking about uh, so the the bird the bird scooters and there's a few other scooter companies in Indianapolis. Um, and they're really popular on campus. There are these rental scooters, um, electric scooters that people can rent and um, drive around the downtown area and around campus and stuff. And, um, I am a wheelchair user and I'm legally blind. So I drive a power chair and use a long white cane at the same time. And I can see some as well. Um, sent with my central vision and what I found challenging in um, a way with my legal blindness being in a power chair and being having neurodivergency is um, the scooters would be left in the middle of sidewalks everywhere and I found it to be very overwhelming and frustrating to not be able to, some, sometimes to be unable to get around them unless somebody moved them, to sometimes miss it with my cane and hit it with my chair, or to find it with my cane and just be annoyed that it was there, or to be so overwhelmed that I couldn't take a trip from one part of campus to another without running not literally running into, but just coming across so many scooters just laying around or just being parked in the middle of like a ramp to cross the street or the sidewalk in my um, residence hall apartment complex or just somewhere where it was either hard to get around it or it was just a really inconvenient place for it to be parked where it was right in the middle of everything, not off to the side, blocking things. Um, and I just thought it was really unfair. And I reached out to campus police. I reached out to my hall director. Um, I was unable to find a way to contact the scooter companies, unfortunately, but I reached out to many other um, people to try to see how this could be solved. And I found out from people that on other college campuses and in other cities, you get continuously charged until you return it to a parking station. And that's not the case in Indianapolis. You get, you can turn it off and you stop getting charged, but leave it anywhere you want to leave it as long as it's in like the vicinity that the scooters are supposed to be. And I just think that's a problem. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you. Stephanie, can you help me communicate? Yes. Um, so it sounds like you've all had Frustrating times with structural ableism. So it sounds like you've all had frustrating times with structural ableism. Um, 
it can be in many forms. It comes in many forms. Like a rain tree. I didn't of writing. A tree's of writing. Uh, I'm sorry. A tree's of writing. T-H-O-R-T. Interesting choice. Yeah. Thank you. Choice of writing. Of the light. Oh, like choice of lighting. Things that don't work. With thing to things that don't work, like public transportation, like public transportation, and things in the way on a sidewalk, and things in the way on a sidewalk. Both of those. Both. Both of those don't allow wheelchair users. Don't allow wheelchair users to navigate where they need to be. To navigate where they need to be. Next, will you describe an event or space that you found accessible? What features made it accessible for you? Finally. Okay, how about that? Thank you, I'd love to share. Um, so I don't live in Indianapolis anymore. I'm back living at home with my mom in Northwest Indiana. And um, I go to a church here in Northwest Indiana that has multiple locations. And I go to our main location in Dyer, Indiana. And um, our church has a disability ministry called Reflectors. And because of that disability ministry, our church has taken on a huge, um, a huge interest in inclusion for people with disabilities. Um, I find our church uses universal design extremely well. And um, our main campus has built a large accessible bathroom that has an adult changing table for those who need it. It can fit a power chair and someone who might need to assist can easily fit as well. Um, I can completely turn my chair in the bathroom. I can fit my chair under the counter to wash my hands. There are grab bars in the restroom. Um, our entire church building is accessible. And um, there are classrooms on Sundays and inclusive activities throughout the week for people with disabilities. Um, there are activities for people of all different types of disabilities and um, respite for families. There are groups for families who need support sometimes. Um, they have worked on providing materials in braille and large print to participants in the special needs ministry. They have volunteers that have worked on learning sign language. Um, they just work really hard to have, they try to have sensory friendly events 
they work really hard to do all kinds of different things for universal design. And I find it's a very successful um, experience for universal design. It's a place I'm really comfortable going to because um, there's always like a volunteer that I know can help me. And I feel comfortable in my learning environment for church and having my materials made available in a way that's accessible to me. And even knowing that I can go to the bathroom and know that it's gonna be accessible to me. Thank you, Lexi, that sounds great. Um, it definitely is, thank you. No problem, how about you? I thought right away about my um, extended family because my parents as well as my <laughs> in the past two years have made adjustments that just helped me be able to um, be in their homes more successfully. So when I'm there, they will turn off the big overhead lights, especially certain bulbs are kind of flickery and those are really hard for me. So they'll have those turned off with just um, like standing lamps plugged in at the side and just having the television turned off so that that screen doesn't start any dizziness for me um, and making sure there's no ceiling fans moving for the same reason um, for that visual dizziness makes a really big difference. So I've appreciated them just making those small adjustments that, um, yeah, help me feel well while I'm there. That's awesome. Um, tell me, how about you? Well, I live in Boston and we have the country's oldest public transit line, amongst others. And over the past, uh, since the ADA, they've made the trains more, trolleys more accessible. Yeah. Excuse me. Cancel. Um, the newest model train trolleys have low floor with a ramp that extends on its own. So I don't have to wait for the conductor to come out and deploy the ramp. It's easier to get on once I'm inside. There's ample space in the train to turn and get into an accessible parking spot and be locked down, get the chair locked down if I want to. All of the public transit stations a fully accessible with universal design, accommodating a broad variety of disabilities, which is so much easier to make use of. Examples would be uh, redundant elevators at underground stops, um, plenty of sign language, tactile strips for surface transition, and other things that I've seen people with other disabilities navigate quite easily. And it's a comfort to be able to know I can go out my door, get on a train and go where I choose and have no difficulties thereafter. Yeah, that independent is awesome. Um, Stephanie, can you repeat what I say? Yeah, that independence is awesome. Um, it's great when people make accommodations for us. It's great when people make accommodations for us. And what I'm hearing is that you feel 
empowered by that. And what I'm hearing is that you feel empowered by that. And that wonderful when it happens. And that's wonderful when it happens. Finally, what would you like our viewers to know? Thank you. Go ahead, Bethany. Okay. I think I would like you to know, well, when my family members have already done that for me before I even get there, it makes me feel so much more welcome. Um, whereas when I'm going somewhere and I need to request each of those things, it's easy for that to feel like I'm being needy or like maybe they would prefer to just be able to leave on the television or leave on the candle that's flickering light is bothering me or whatever it is. Um, so I think kind of like what Jen said, just by going ahead and making those accommodations you're able to make other people feel so much more welcome and um, just reduce that chance of them feeling like they're being a burden or being needy or whatever it might be. How about you, I think I'd like our viewers to know that the individuals, um, we on this call that you see today and that you're hearing from today we have disabilities but so much more than that we have capabilities and we're capable to be out on a regular basis in our day-to-day -day lives um those of us who have these disabilities yet capabilities to be out and about our disabilities don't go away when we leave the house. So if we're navigating an environment, whether it's a vision impairment or whether we use a wheelchair or whether we have a sensory need when we're in a restaurant or in a public space, like Stephanie does, um, that, that we carry that with us, but we have the capability to still go out. And the way you can help us is always consider that we could be the next one to appear in that environment at any moment. And we're welcome there. So please welcome us by making it comfortable and welcoming for us and inclusive for us. Please give us that universal design because we are, I don't wanna use the word entitled because we, we don't wanna act entitled, yet we are entitled to be there just as someone without a disability is entitled to be there. And we're entitled to be comfortable just as someone without a disability who doesn't need those accommodations is entitled to be comfortable in that environment. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you. And tell me, Lexi, you me. Sorry, I didn't quite get that. Let's hear from you. Okay. Well, I would like the viewers to know that universal design doesn't just accommodate or make things easy for folks with quote unquote disabilities. Society at large benefits from universal access. And if it's looked at just in the light of accommodating disabilities, then it's cast in a negative light. However, if it's looked at as benefiting society at large, there's no um, 
burden to it in society can further itself grow and learn to accept many things differently. And when they see someone with a quote unquote disability out in public, they may learn something and grow in turn from that. So the more we're out there with easy access, the more everyone benefits, I believe. Thank you, Daphne. Um, Daphne, can you help me? Yes. Um, well, I hope we take away from this. What I hope we take away from this is that it's not necessarily that difficult to accommodate disability. Is that it's not necessarily that difficult to accommodate disabilities. Um, and in your work in the community. Did you say, and in your work in the community? Yeah. It's helpful if presenting it. It's helpful that if people that provide prevention work. It's helpful that people would provide prevention work. That they advocate. That they educate. And advocate. And advocate. For simple, um, simple things that they can do. For simple things that they can do. To include people with all kinds of disabilities. To include people with all kinds of disabilities. In the community. In the community. Um, not every community. Not every community. Has the same disability has the same disabilities but as you work within your community but as you work within your community you it's important to accept what kind of disabilities they are. It's good to assess what kind of disabilities they are. And provide what is needed. And provide what is needed. Um, thank you for it. Thank you, panelists. This now we're done. Yep. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you for putting it together. Slide at the post note saying save the date. We have an upcoming webinar on July 18th from 12 to 1:30. The topic is the intersectionality of racism, ableism, and sexual violence prevention. Watch our newsletter for more information. This slide has the IDJ logo and says this slide. Mm.
This slide has the IDJ logo and says Disability Justice and Violence Prevention Resource Hub. On our hub you will find first-person stories, art, and creative writing, webinars, risk and protective factors for people with disabilities, accessible evaluation, and newsletters. Please subscribe. Founded in 2018, IDJ created a Disability Justice and Violence Prevention Resource Hub. The hub is the container for all of our violence prevention work. We offer more than 22 webinars and a YouTube channel organized and delivered by disabled and neurodivergent people for people with disabilities and allies. We have been able to distribute nearly $18,000 to disabled and neurodiverse content creators who have submitted art, creative writing, and more. If you sign up for our newsletter you will have access to content curated from the hub, along with resources from our favorite DJ powerhouses. We offer free accessible evaluation, including the Sidewalks to Sexual Violence Prevention Guide to Social Inclusion with Adults with Cognitive and Developmental Disabilities. And we just released an organizational evaluation tool and invite you to join this process as a private process or with a growing learning community. This slide has our... Okay, um, now I like it. See if there's any questions about anything we talked about today. Now I would like to ask if there are any questions um, about anything we talked about today. I don't have any. <laughs> you can put them in the chat or just unmute your mic. You can put them in the chat or just unmute your mic. I have a question about IDJ and um, the um, ICD, ICDV. Okay. So this presentation talked about preventing sexual violence, but does IDJ address, address, um, other violence, like emotional or psychological violence, like emotional and psychological abuse and domestic violence such as that and um. stuff like that? We have a variety of topics on our website. We have a variety of topics on our website. Is that the website that was listed on the last page? I believe so. It was yeah. like the IN disabilityjustice.org. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And we we include all kinds of violence on the website. We include all kinds of violence on the website. But um, primarily our grant is for sexual violence prevention. Did you say, but primarily our grant is just for sexual violence prevention? Yes. Okay. Do you, does your website offer resources about like finding, um, finding resources? Yes, we okay. have a list of resources. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Any other questions from the audience? Yes, we actually have a question for Stephanie. Michelle would like to know, were you ever able to find another class to attend? 
Not for Zumba. I still attended other like strength training or different classes like that, but not for that specific class that I had been part of for years. Mm -mm. And no, Jen, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. So this is an invitation to be part of a, a focus group for violence prevention and intervention that happens in Indianapolis, Indiana. The Domestic Violence Network is partnering with Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence to hear from BIPOC people with disabilities to help domestic violence network shape their organizational practices and their this will be compensated with a $50 gift card you can scan this QR code or email my colleague Tamika Jones at t jones at i c a D V I N C dot org. Thank you, Sierra. You're welcome. And I am really sorry that I missed yet the time. Okay. I'm really sorry that I misjudged the time. Um, but that's all I have for us. But that's all I have for us. Um, you can contact us with the info on the screen. You can contact us with the info on the screen. And we'd be more than happy. To hear from me. And we'd be more than happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. We will send out the recording and the slides eventually. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, if, if you are on the panel, and you would like to hang out to do a bit of a debrief, that would be great. Right now, our participants are slowly leaving the room and I am going to go ahead and stop recording.